does Emmeth control Uranus? Is an ancient weapon what he's going to use now that it's the right time? It's been a while since we've had 19 pages for a One Piece chapter, and chapter 1120 is 19 pages of action, lore, and new mysteries, all culminating in my belief that we might be seeing the ancient weapon Uranus soon. We obviously have a lot to get through today, so we're gonna get straight into it. Chapter 1120 starts with what is, in my opinion, a very unexpected flashback between Vegapunk and Clover. We did already know that the two were already acquainted because that was revealed in chapter 1066, but for the first time, we actually see an interaction between the two set 26 years ago at Punk Hazard. Now, what first caught my eye about this flashback was the physical landscape of Punk Hazard. When we were first introduced to the island, it was such a desolate location. You know, it was ice or fire. Very harsh conditions because of the battle between Kuzan and Sakazuki. And now we know that that state is such a stark contrast of what the island used to be. Looking at this chapter, Punk Hazard was a tropical island with lush and thriving vegetation. We've got coconut trees here. Looks like a good place for a holiday. Even the factories and the laboratories they sort of look like castles or palaces the way that they've been designed. It gives off that sense that Punk Hazard was once a great, impressive, aesthetically pleasing place. We also see some interesting motifs in the first page. The danger sign uses a symbol of a creature with horns, very reminiscent of who's who or the numbers that we saw back in the Wano arc. And even from outside of the gate, you can see that there is a similar looking horned creature peeping over the gate. And this is most likely a callback to the numbers from the Wano arc, the numbers which were the beasts that were a part of Kaido's crew. And it was explained in chapter 989 that Kaido bought the numbers, which were failed experimentations or attempts to recreate the ancient giants at Punk Hazard. Anyways, the numbers aren't the only callback in this flashback. We also see the dragons. And that seems to be a reference to the dragons that we know that Vegapunk also created to safeguard and protect Punk Hazard. But of course, the most interesting, most intriguing part about this flashback is the big reveal that Clover is a part of the D-Clan. And now, very interestingly, we get two translations of Clover's real name, or his full name. The unofficial is Cleave D. Clover, whereas the Viz official calls him Clow D. Clover. And now the spelling for these two, Cleav or Clow, in English are very different. And I think this variation comes down to the various layers of spellings and translations between three different languages, Irish, Gaelic, Japanese, and English. And although those two names, Cleav and Clow, seem very different, it's actually possible that both of these names could be correct. So it's just interesting that the Viz translation went with a different spelling, given the really potentially lore-rich and lore-filled implications of using the name Cleav versus Clow. And just as a side note here, I am going to use the Munster Irish pronunciation Cleave, only because, to the best of my understanding, that MH spelling at the end of Cleave comes from the Munster region, and that's how that name is pronounced in Munster Irish. But if we look at the Viz official translation, Cloud D Clover, that seems to be a pun on cloud or cloudy. And I think that could potentially have some sort of significance for Clover's name, particularly if we think about it in the context of Sky Islands, Weatheria, or maybe even the idea that up until this flashback, Clover's backstory has been shrouded in clouds. You know, it's been, you know, we didn't know the full story yet because it was hidden, it was a secret, or maybe it will be a completely other interpretation that will become clearer for us in the future. More interestingly, if we take the name Cleave, Cleave seems to be most likely a reference to Irish or Scottish Gaelic folktales featuring the Cleave Soleil, which in English translates to the Sword of Light. Now, even apart from the Cleave Soleil mythology, the first thing that ran through my head when I found out about his full name was of the Irish and British race relations. Knowing that Clover is now a D, I was very much reminded of the fact that the Irish were a persecuted race and that they faced oppression from British in history. And knowing the relationship between the Celestial Dragons, whom we know to be the descendants of the 20 or should I say the 19 kingdoms that faced the Ancient Kingdom, it sort of fits that the D-Clan 
has been persecuted by the Celestial Dragons and that Clover and his brother are clear examples of that history of race-related persecution. But after doing a quick search on the internet, Clover's name and his Irish-inspired lineage seems to be even more important. So the Cleave Soleil, or this mystical sword of light, this seems to be an artifact that commonly appears in many tales in Irish Gaelic culture that takes the form of some quasi bridal quest. These stories tend to center around a hero who gains a beautiful wife upon his adventure and then can't return home until he gains this mystical sword. What I also found was that interestingly, alongside this sword of light is another very often appearing element and that element is the search for the one story. And obviously that automatically makes me think of the one piece. The way that I have interpreted it is as if this sword is integral to finding the one story, which for me translates to Clover having been integral to finding the one piece. And I think that actually checks out. It makes perfect sense when you think about Clover's role in the series. Now knowing his deeper history, the fact that he kept his D heritage a secret, but then following his brother's death, he became resolute to finding out the secrets of history, all of his years of research, and then his relentless loyalty to ensure that his findings, the work of the O'Hara archaeologists would survive. You know, sacrificing his own life to ensure the survival of his books. I think we could say that Clover was indeed integral to finding the One Piece, or would be integral to eventually finding the One Piece, because without him, Vegapunk wouldn't have had access to the secrets of the Void Century to be relaying this message to the world right now. And in this way, I find Clover's story so beautifully ironic. Perhaps the best way to put it is it's a wonderful case of poetic justice. I think we could say that we have a full circle moment or full circle character development for Clover, Clover having lied to survive, went to dying wanting to reveal the truth. He lied in order to live, but then died for the truth. And like I said, without that lie, we may never have been able to find out the truth of the world because he's inspired others to continue that inquiry for the truth. And after reading this chapter 1120, I actually went back to read chapter 397. And now I wouldn't quite say that Clover is smiling in his last moments, that smile being characteristic of the D-Clan. But I would say that Clover still does look fearless and resolute. And now knowing about his brother and his lineage, I get the sense that Clover has made peace with himself and about his fate. And he's not scared of death, which I have to say that very much still fits with what we know of the D-Clan. Anyways, we then jump forward to another flashback now set 22 years ago, which is set immediately after the O'Hara incident. And then we get another poignant, very beautifully ironic scene, Vegapunk's dialogue about, you know, who's going to be dumb enough to carry on the research of the O'Haran scholars, which is, you know, obviously very ironic because we know that Vegapunk was indeed dumb enough to carry on that quest and that he too, like Clover, paid with his life for it. And I'm reminded of that quote or that saying about bravery and stupidity, the brave are stupid or it's a fine line between bravery and foolishness, but I think you get my drift. And it's really touching to see Vegapunk's emotional response here. It's a nice contrast to the coldness that he displayed earlier during the Clover flashback. And I really appreciate that Oda dedicated a full panel, like a sizable panel dedicated to Vegapunk crying. You know, throughout the Egghead arc, we keep seeing choices that Vegapunk has made throughout his life. You know, the choice to continue working for the world government, even if that means betraying or turning his back on his friends. And then we see him lament and regret those actions later when it's too late. We first saw that during the Kuma flashback and now with Clover. And so I'm really glad that now in the present, as we witness his final action, 
or his dying legacy via his message to the world, Vegapunk's legacy won't be his servitude to the world government. With his death, he's ensured the will of those he respected and admired like Clover and like Kuma to live on. And I really like that as an ending for Vegapunk's character. And I think that's how he would have liked to have been remembered as well. As a man whom, like his friends and as a scientist, was someone committed to the truth. Now, if we keep going in the chapter, when we get back to the present, we see reaction piece continue. This time with Baratier and Tequila Wolf. Now, Zeph's reaction here really intrigues me because I wonder how much of the world's history and lore Zeph knows. Zeph is most likely to have been already a well-known pirate around the same era as Roger's era of piracy. And I am jumping forth a little bit here. But because a part of Vegapunk's last major reveals during his message is of Roger's true name, Gold D. Roger, I wonder what Zeph knew of the whole situation. Because we know that some, like Kureha, already knew that Roger's name was actually Gold D and not Gold, whereas a lot of others were in the dark. Otherwise, I also can't help but overthink about the insert of Baratier at this particular moment of Vegapunk's message. Usually, these reactions seem to be saved for those who are invested or at least somehow involved or related to what's going on. For example, Robin and her connection to Tequila Wolf, hence why Tequila Wolf is also part of the reaction panels in this chapter. So I do wonder whether the Zeph and Patty panel may be a hint of something else to be revealed in the future, but you know, I might be overthinking it. Now, whereas for that cutaway to Tequila Wolf, they're not actually reacting, we're just seeing what's going on at that moment in another place in the world. And Tequila Wolf and and the construction going on there remains one of the great mysteries of the series and I just feel very sure that this will soon become of importance to the lore of it all. And you know what? I am actually going to jump ahead here and I am going to talk about the remainder of Vegapunk's message about Roger and the D-Clan. So obviously that reveal isn't a major surprise for us because we've known for, you know, God knows how long, but it was obviously an unknown for the majority of the world. And then what is Vegapunk's view of humanity's future? Every time I feel like we're at the end of his message, he just keeps continuing. And I really can't wait to see now what his fine Final grand message will be. He ends on this very intriguing idea of his view of humanity's future. Is it simply that those with the will of D will continue their quest and find out what their lineage really means? That one D member in particular? Obviously, we're just gonna have to wait and see. Now, because the reveal about Clover was told to us by way of a flashback, it's not really clear how much of Clover's story was relayed to the world. Because we do also see Robin's face being covered but it's quite clear that she's upset and she's distressed because I think based on Vegapunk's dialogue in that moment, it's clear that he is referring to Clover. But I'm not convinced that Vegapunk has just relayed the entire truth about Clover's D heritage as part of his message. So I'm not convinced that Robin knows the full truth of Clover's backstory. But who knows, maybe she did already know or maybe she's just found out. You know, maybe Robin does know something about the D clan that she hasn't actually shared with us yet. She has been known to do that from time to time. Either way, I quite appreciated this panel because I think it further deepens that relationship between Robin and Professor Clover. The idea that both Robin and Clover went through similar traumatic experiences of having their loved ones die right in front of their eyes. In Clover's case, it seems to have been his brother, whereas for Robin, it was Clover, her mother, Saul, and the rest of the archaeologists. But the fact that she's now with the Straw Hats, that she's traveling with Luffy, a fellow D-Clan member, and the reincarnated Joy Boy himself, I think that makes for such beautiful storytelling. You know, Egghead has been such an emotional arc for Robin, what with her interaction with Shaka earlier and finding out about Saul. I just can't wait to see their reunion at Elbaf. Now, the next 10 pages or so of chapter 1120 goes primarily into action sequences. And I have to say that overall, I love, I thoroughly enjoyed the way that Oda designed the paneling in this chapter. Particularly the way that he drew the interactions between Atlas and Venus Juro was really impressive, made following the battle so much easier and so much more dynamic. But if we do break down what happened in chapter 1120, Atlas 
Atlas has ensured Lilith's survival by switching her off, knocking her out, and sacrificing herself to make sure that at least one good Vegapunk survives. Obviously, a great moment for Atlas. I would say the VIP of chapter 1120, maybe even the Egghead Island arc itself. And now Atlas has joined the ranks of those legendary characters who have sacrificed themselves for the greater good. And she's also died with a smile on her face. So she's been given that D clan treatment, which I think is very fitting. But now this actually also begs the question of whether she'll also be given the will of P treatment. You know, as fans know, we've got Pedro, Pell before him, and Pound, all of whom have also sacrificed themselves only to come back alive later. Wait a second, Hunk. Atlas. All jokes aside, to be honest, I personally don't think that this will be a fake out death. I have personally been expecting, and I think a lot of us have been expecting, that it will only be one good Vegapunk surviving by the end of the arc, and I think that seems to be what is playing out. I think it was also assumed that Lilith would be that final Vegapunk survivor, which I think I mentioned in my discussion for chapter 1119 as well. Lilith, because she was the first Vegapunk that we were introduced to, and because it gives an opportunity for Oda to continue drawing her backside. There is technically another Vegapunk left because York is still alive. And now I am of two minds about this. Are we going to have a cat and mouse situation where we've got one good and one bad Vegapunk? You know, will this be used as a plot device because York still has access to punk records whilst Lilith can't? Or will York get caught up in whatever Emmeth seems to have planned for his final moment? And then maybe York won't survive and Lilith will really become the last surviving Vegapunk. And then in which case, we also have to question, unlike other companions who've joined the Straw Hats temporarily in the past, like Kinemon, like Carrot, like Lore, for example, Lilith really has no home to return to, especially if Egghead becomes destroyed by the end of this arc, which is a scenario that is more and more likely to occur. In which case, does this mean that Lilith will become a forever Straw Hat? She will actually join the crew, and then in that case, what does that mean for Bonnie's chances of joining the crew. I also have to admit that there is a tiny part of me considering whether Oda is going to pull one under us and then actually have York join the Straw Hats instead. You know, is York actually redeemable at all? It is probably more unlikely, but you can never say it's out of the question completely. And then I think if York does actually become redeemable and does indeed join the crew, I think that's pretty funny because then Frankie would have some competition to be the crew's exhibitionist. But back to the action, like I said, a lot of cool dynamic moments, even Saturn's movements in this arc. The way that Oda drew him jumping off Jupiter and then scuttling aboard, you know, running after Bonnie and Kuma felt very real, felt very dynamic. And for me, the fact that Saturn is so obsessed with Kuma and Bonnie, I can't help but wonder whether there is even more to the relationship or the history between these characters. I know that many have already been theorizing that Saturn might even be Bonnie's biological father, and I'm not saying that I completely buy into that theory, but I do have to say it's just a bit strange that he's so fixated on going after these two. You know, why is he going after Kumara and Bonnie rather than joining the other Gorosei to eliminate the Iron Giant or even go after to kill Luffy? who surely is the bigger threat at this moment. You know, is it just because of Bonnie's own Devil Fruit ability? Has he realized that, holy crap, Bonnie is actually also a serious problem that we're going to have to deal with? But now, speaking of Emmett, perhaps the segment of this chapter that has been on my mind ever since I read it, what is Emmett's next move? Now, before we actually get into what I think his next plans are, there are some other lore-filled important details that I think are worth discussing. Firstly, classic Luffy doesn't know who Joy Boy is, more or less oblivious to the whole situation, doesn't realize that Emmeth is talking to him about him. Emmeth himself doesn't seem to recognize that Luffy isn't the same Joy Boy that he knew in the past. It's like as if he's talking to Luffy, expecting that they are the same person. I guess the simplest answer is that Luffy is now just exuding that same Joy Boy energy. It's that same feeling that Emmeth got from when he used to interact with the original Joy Boy or the previous Joy Boy. I guess we have also seen from a previous chapter that the silhouette of the Joy Boy of the Void Century and Luffy in his Joy Boy or Gear Fifth form are pretty much identical. And we also know that Luffy seems to emit the same drums of liberation of the previous 
destroy boy and we knew that from the Wano arc and how Zunesha responded. But the wild speculating part of my brain can't help but wonder whether this bears more support for the theory that Joy Boy of the past is actually Luffy of the future. Whether we're going to get this convoluted time traveling sequence where an older Luffy of the future then travels, you know, 800 years into the past, leaves a message for the world to wait for Luffy of the then future, which I think is a very controversial theory. Some people seem to love it, others seem to hate it. I don't really feel any particular way about it, but if Oda is able to pull it off, and if anyone can, then I do think it's Oda, good for him. And for us. But if we do actually go back to the drums of liberation, this is another very interesting aspect because it seems to be different to the voice of all things. So not everyone could hear Luffy's drums of liberation, but the Elbafian giants could. Back at Wano, we saw that Momo also couldn't hear it, but Zunisha could. But now we also see that the giants couldn't hear Emeth speak. Only Luffy could hear the Iron Giant speak. So it's almost as if we have three different voices going on. It seems like in the case of Emeth, and Luffy's conversation, it's a conversation that only exists between those two. It's a connection that only exists between those two. The drums of liberation is something different altogether. And then the voice of all things is also separate from that because Momo, Zunisha, Luffy, and others who've also had the voice of all things in the past, like Roger and Odin, have access to that. And then if that mystery of all the different voices isn't enough, we also have the mystery of Emmett's next move. What is Emmeth going to pull? What does he mean when he says that I'm going to use it? You know, what is it? Okay, so let's unpack the situation over here. Emmeth has to stop the five elders. He has to hold off the Gorosei, which is no easy feat because as we've seen, the Gorosei are the most resilient beings that we have witnessed in the series to date. You know, even Venus Juro, after being blown up by Atlas, he's returned here with half of his head gone. He's still in action. And because Emmeth has recognized that some of the Gorosei, like Saturn, are still after Luffy and the Straw Hats, Emmeth now knows that this is the time. This is the time that Joy Boy warned him of. This is the time that Joy Boy promised. But then, what is Emmett's special power or move? You know, is it simply another attack? Because in which case, we have seen that he doesn't have the power to pull off major attacks because his body's too old for it. You know, he doesn't have any moves of his own. Is he just gonna blow himself up? You know, similar to how Atlas did? In which case, I would also wonder, would Oda pull the same thing again when we've just seen it from Atlas? You know, is it big enough? Is it exciting enough? Is it climactic enough? And then, what's also strong enough to stop the Gorosei when Atlas blowing herself up wasn't enough to even fully disable one of the Gorosei? And all of this has led to me wondering, does Emmeth control Uranus? Is his secret move the use of an ancient weapon? And I have to say, thematically, I think it's fitting. It seems like Joy Boy has entrusted the other ancient weapons to his allies. Poseidon, naturally so, because she is an actual organic being. But Pluton was entrusted with the Kazuki clan, a known ally of Joy Boy's. And so maybe Joy Boy also entrusted Uranus with his ally and his likely former crewmate, Emmet. And I also can't help but think that the use of the ancient weapon may just be what we witnessed to be that major resolution to the egghead incident, that earth-shattering moment that we read about in the headlines the next day. You know, a lot of this arc, and even a lot of Vegapunk's message, has revolved around ancient weapons, their destructive force, and what would be more apt than ending this banger of an arc with us witnessing just how destructive the ancient weapons really are. You know, we haven't actually seen it for ourselves yet. We saw the potential of it with Poseidon, but we haven't actually seen exactly how destructive the use of an ancient weapon is. And given how Vegapunk's just been warning the entire world of it, are we really going to see the use of an ancient weapon to conclude the Egghead Island arc. That's my theory. That's where my brain is at right now. I might be wrong, but let me know what you think. Let me know by leaving a comment below. This has been another one of a crazy rambling scenario for me. So thank you all for listening and sticking it out this far. If you've liked the discussion, if you like the video, please like, 
please do subscribe to the channel. You can also support the channel further by becoming a channel member or a Patreon member. And a big thank you to our current patrons and channel members for your continued support. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.